Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, our workshop series. Uh, it's my big pleasure to introduce a long-term friend of mine, uh, Professor Jeffrey Hess, whom we met first in 1991, before USSR has collapsed. Of course, it doesn't mean that uh, it was Jeff who you know, brought uh, uh, post-socialism to us, but uh, you know, his, uh, uh, by default, uh, maybe the, one of the best Russian scholars in the United States, I, uh, in addition to his uh, experience uh, working on post-socialism, he is uh, one of the best experts in the city of Leningrad. It's uh, basically the area where we worked together for maybe 20, 25 years. His dissertation was uh, on uh, uh, transformation, transition of Russia, and the title was to undiscover country, institutions, authority, culture, and Russia's transition to the markets, uh, 1988 to 1997. And Jeff uh, visited Russia many times, and he interviewed uh, people, you know, uh, who basically privatized this country, at least in this part of Russia, in Northwest Russia. And he collected enormous amount of interviews and the edits uh, with uh, uh, his analysis uh, as a sociologist. And in addition to his work at Richmond University, where he's a professor at the uh, Department of Sociology, he teaches at St. Petersburg State University. And this April, why he's so sad that we cannot sit together on the seventh uh, uh, linea? Because uh, he's supposed to come and teach at the Department of Economics, where he's a part-time professor teaching economic sociology. And in addition to this, he is uh, on the editorial board of uh, uh, Vesnik of St. Petersburg State University, and he is very active in promoting uh, uh, St. Petersburg State University in the United States. Today he's, talking, he's going to talk about making sense of post-socialism, and uh, uh, maybe he will answer us uh, when post-socialism ends, right? And where we are today, you know, from the perspective of a sociologist. Jeff, floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you all. It's my pleasure. Now let me, without further ado, you guys can stare at this um, rather than at me. Um, talk to Nikita about this need to ask me to talk a little bit about how we make sense of what happened, certainly beginning in 1992, but really taking form um, in the last years of Gorbachev. I would argue that post-socialism, whether it ended or not, is a matter of how one delineates historical periods, certainly we are still feeling the after effects, the aftershocks of post-socialism. So if you want to use the metaphor of an earthquake, the 90s were the main quake, but we still get the aftershocks. Um, and those aftershocks will be felt for quite a while. The question is, what exactly happened in the 1990s? That's where I'm going to focus most of the talk. I'm not going to talk only about my own work. I mean, I see this more as just giving a general overview as to what the discourse and the ideas were, because there are really two interesting phenomena here. The first is what happened um, politically, economically, socially in Russia and comparatively across um, various countries in the post-Soviet bloc. Um, and there's so much more work that needs to be done there. Um, at the same time, there's also the intellectual question of how the great thinkers, the academics responded to this. Um, and that's part of the story I'm gonna tell here as well in that post-socialism ends up inextricably tied to the intellectual story of how the experts and those who follow their advice frame the economic, political, and social worlds in which we live. In a sense, one acted back upon the other. Um, that's part of the story. Now, why this is so important, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but in 1944, Karl Polanyi, published a book called The Great Transformation. He wanted to explain where fascism um, had come from. Why is it we got involved in this you know, horrible war on the continent and the rest of the world? And he blamed the Great Depression for this. The Great Depression um, had led the majority of people to, um, to move either towards the left or socialism or to the right towards fascism. But what is it that led to that? The Great Depression and this need to embrace two more radical forms of politics. His claim was that market capitalism was not 
simply a set of institutions that unleashed homo economicus. And this is kind of the misreading of Adam Smith, that it is the urge of humanity to truck and barter. And so capitalist institutions kind of arise as we try to perfect that trucking and bartering. Um, those of you who ever studied Douglas North, Oliver Williamson, or New Institutional Economics will have run across this. Capitalist institutions are our way of making economies smoother. Um, Polanyi claimed, in fact, this was BS. This was absolutely wrong. That we are not homo economicus, that rather reciprocity, for example, redistribution, um, are ingrained in who we are. We are social creatures. And that creating capitalism, a market economy, meant creating market politics and a market society. And so the 19th century in particular was this almost traumatic transformation, not just of institutions, but of social structures and of how humans um, act. Uh, I would argue that this is what post-socialism was. It was a great retransformation or the great transformation revisited. The recreation, not simply the adjustment of institutions, but the remaking of structures, of practices, of senses of normality. And so on the one hand, it is traumatic in its own way, and it's that trauma that we still feel today. But it's also this moment to go back and revisit what had happened in the 19th century, which those of you who know your intellectual history gave birth to the social sciences. The social sciences, in particular sociology, were born in an attempt to make sense of what this grand, great, great transformation was and how it reverberated. Now, just a little bit of background, you probably all know all of this. Um, the USSR is created, Stalin comes to power, um, he creates this wonderful planned economy that has various built-in efficiencies and inefficiencies. It has its own logic. Stephen Kotkin has been writing a lot about this lately, and I'm sure he'd want you to buy his book. Buy it used so he doesn't get any more money. He won a lot of money from poker, as it was once upon a time. So we have the command economy, which is coming to a problematic moment in the 70s and the 80s. We have the great moment, the great decade of stagnation under Leonid Brezhnev. Um, several other leaders die after him, and we have a new generation come to power. Gorbachev's dilemma, of course, is getting out of this period of stagnation and somehow reinvigorating um, socialism in the command economy. What he ended up doing was unraveling the um, fabric of the Soviet economy in general, in general. Very quick, because this is kind of setting up what happened with post-socialism. Some of his reforms are organizational, institutional, and they're a liberalization of sorts, part liberalization. For example, the creation and liberalization of Birgi as a way for different economic actors, enterprises, or entrepreneurs, for example, to find each other, um, for suppliers to find buyers. It was supposed to be a way of getting around um, the rigidity of the command economy where suppliers did not often deliver the quantity and quality of needed supplies. There was enterprise reform as well. For example, shop floors were allowed to turn themselves into cooperatives, rented firms, small firms, so that after they would produce state orders, they could then produce on the side, uh, making additional money, for example, building dachas, doing repairs, that kind of thing. And the hope was that these reforms would tap into the shadow economy um, and into some of the corruption, some of the inefficiencies, tap into um, entrepreneurial innovation while maintaining um, state control overall of the economy. The problem is um, there was liberalization without accountability. This led to um, broadly put what are called bank runs. You all know, know what a bank run is. Everyone stands in line at the bank to take their money out. The bank loses resources, immediately collapses. As a general metaphor, you had a run on finances, you had a run on raw materials from enterprises, etc. cetera. Um, without any clear idea of where any of this was going, you had the reintroduction of some rationing towards the very end of the USSR. Essentially, everything was falling apart. Now, alongside this, you had political opening, you had waves of, of nationalist mobilization. So Gorbachev lets the genie out of the bottle, everything falls apart, the USSR ceases to exist at the end of 1991, and we get the coming of post-socialism, um, shock therapy. Um, some of you have lived through this, you can sleep right now. Those of you who were born around this time, I don't know how new this is, 
shock therapy is introduced um, into East Europe and then Russia following its introduction into Latin America in the 1980s. Um, Latin okay. America had, had similar issues, state-owned enterprises, price controls, but the red tape. It was presumed that shock therapy had worked in Latin America. Why will it not work in socialist countries? Um, Jeffrey Sachs, David Lipton had written a set of influential papers from Brookings Institute in the late 80s that were used to justify introducing shock therapy to Poland, who would then be taken to Russia, former Soviet countries. The basic presumption is this, presumption that in each one of us is homo economicus waiting to leap out. Andre Schlaefer, for example, made this argument um, in the late 80s um, using what survey data he could get a hold of, and there was some time, that Russians, in fact, had no problem with liberalized trade, entrepreneurship, private property. Russians wanted to be um, entrepreneurs just like us. So basically, this assumption of homo economicus everywhere, unleash it, justify shock therapy, few years of pain. Um, but after that pain, markets will correct themselves and the combination of desperation and innovation, the need to eat, but also the desire to truck and barter will lead to the reanimation of former socialist economies. So tighten your belts for a while, it'll be a rough ride, but eventually things will restabilize. <clears throat> so this is kind of the parameters of that entire theory. Um, Jeffrey Sachs, Anders Osland, David Lipton, Andre Schleifer were kind of the biggies here. Sachs and Osland in particular seem to be coming to Moscow all the time. Um, Sachs, to his benefit, actually argued that shock therapy done at home was not enough. There also had to be massive aid to create some kind of safety net, and there had to be immediate massive investment so that not only do you have privatization, you can have investment in new technology, and that would get employment back up to speed. That part was never quite carried out. But to this day, Sachs still argues that, well, shock therapy wasn't tried, so it couldn't have failed. Um, problem was enough of it was tried. And there were holes within shock therapy, in particular this idea that simply unleashing homo economicus means, a la new institutional economics, the institutions and the practices of a good functioning market economy will emerge. Now, here were some of the main um, foundations of shock therapy. Quick liberalization, free up markets. Um, essentially allow people to open up shop if need be as quickly as possible. This didn't work so well. Throughout the 1990s, there was still red tape. Bankruptcy and contract are easy to kind of invoke, but difficult to put into practice. What exactly do bankruptcy and contract involve? Um, for example, if someone violates a contract with my business, how do I go after them? I can go to the law, but courts are backed up. Judges do not necessarily know how to implement uncertain legislation. Um, one way of enforcing contract is to freeze bank accounts, but if banks don't know what to do or aren't playing along, you see the issue. Bankruptcy and contract sound so nifty in the shock therapy world, but creating the institutions, the knowledge, and the practices takes years. So this didn't end up working out. You can open up a firm and you can close that firm and disappear with lots of money, um, opportunism, and a lot of that was run rampant. There were entrepreneurs too, I don't want to make it a total negative picture. Another point is monetary discipline. One of the problems in socialist countries is you had what's called ruble overhang. Too many rubles, too few goods in a deficit economy. The Sachs assumed there would be a quick inflationary shock. It would sop up all of those rubles, then control M2. That's the amount of money in circulation. So the central bank, we have to clamp down on monetary emissions. The problem with this is, is that there's too little money in circulation, then the inefficient producers are going to feel the pain. That means a possible spike in unemployment, and you've got these cities out in you know, Siberia, for example, that are company towns. What happens not only to production in say Magnitogorsk, but employment and the entire socioeconomic fabric in the case that you have tight budgets? Country collapses. And in fact, managers would fight back. They would fight back through wage arrears. Just keep producing, but just rack up the debt, the debt to your workers, the debt to your suppliers, start engaging in barter. In fact, the barter economy will explode in the 90s. David Woodruff has written about this, as have um, Gaddy and Ike. Only by 1995, in fact, is the central bank under Tatiana Paramonova able to start getting a grip on monetary discipline, and even then imperfectly. Finally, privatization 
which should create the, event, the incentives for investment, efficient use of resources. Yes, this kind of makes sense, but implementing privatization becomes a serious point of contention. Um, first of all, how should privatization work? The effective way of privatization is sell off your firms to people who have money. They will invest. They might have to fire some of your workers. They might have to sell some of your property, but they will make sure to invest in effective production. On the other hand, this means you will have rising unemployment. Um, you also get this response, um, it's nationalist. Um, if you read factory newspapers around St. Petersburg in the 90s, one of the great fears of privatization is foreigners will come and buy us up. And foreigners will be running the show and we cannot trust foreigners. There is this kind of sense of dependency theory that's running through a lot of popular discourse um, in the early 1990s vis-a-vis -vis privatization. Now, this is a problem in the rest of Europe, and so interestingly, there's variation in the approaches to privatization to somehow find this balance between, on the one hand, jumpstarting the economy, and on the other hand, finding some kind of political compromise that legitimizes private property. So in sum, Sachs's whole approach is quickly create the dictatorship of nature market. Or, there we go. Sachs does not have a monopoly in economics discourse, however, and not soon, not long, not so, not sooner has he actually started to implement shock therapy in East Europe and then Russia. Then he starts facing criticism. One particularly important guy in this is this guy named Peter Morell, who's at the University of Maryland. And Peter Morell starts championing what's called the gradualist approach. He draws upon China as his example of this. Sachs assumes that if you unleash the market, the institutions will arise um, to create efficiency, production, profit, et cetera. To which Peter Morell says, well, not so fast. Humans don't react so mechanistically to institutions. First of all, relying on people like Sidney uh, uh, Nelson and Richard, Richard Nelson and Sidney Winter, he assumes, rightly so, that habits and tacit knowledge are quite important, that markets have to be learned. What does a market mean? There are different forms of markets. So if we're going to market build in Russia, we got to figure out what that market should look like. Um, and then we have to learn the practices involved in that market. That takes time. Okay. Furthermore, their entrenched interests will be against shock there, um, who will fight back, who will undermine those reforms. Red directors, for example. So Morell's suggestion was rather than this kind of quick, painful creation of the market, it should be done gradually. Um, for example, State-owned enterprises are inefficient. They soak up resources. Let them survive as dinosaurs. While the private enterprises are evolving, the dinosaurs will keep people employed. Eventually, the more effective new entrepreneurial firms will start to draw in skilled labor, and then you can shut the dinosaurs down. This is what China did. It seems to have worked for them. And this is eventually what starts to happen in Poland. Poland starts realizing the early 90s shock therapy is too painful. Slow it down. So Morel pushes back but to these really important points, especially this one. And this kind of starts hinting at Polanyi's formulation, that markets aren't simply contract private property that help us truck and barter, but rather a market is a set of habits. It's a culture of sorts embedded in institutions, and it has to be enforced, it has to be learned, it has to become embedded in the social practices. Interesting, this, interestingly, this comes to this contradiction of post-socialism. And it says Sachs is right politically. There's this small window and you have to strike while the iron is hot. Thought therapy makes sense politically while, while potential opponents to marketization are disorganized, take advantage, privatize quickly. This is what Yegor Gaidar, um, Trubias, and others wanted to do. Quick window, privatize fast. Economically, it doesn't make any sense. Politically, it does. Economically, Sachs was totally wrong. Morel was right. But if you drag the process out, you give opponents time to organize. This is a classic problem of development everywhere, and we have yet to find a great solution for it. <clears throat> now, what happens in all of this is economists have gone in with what is already a problematic model of how economies really operate. Um, and so enter political science. And political scientists, and one of my favorites is David Woodruff, and I know he comes to European University every now and then. He's talked about this. So you know, read his work you'll get a lot of what I'm talking about here. Not only him, but there are others as well. Um, one thing you're gonna get with any kind of economic transformation or distributional economies, who is going to get what resources in power? So the first thing we should have been thinking of is Moscow versus the regions in terms of grabbing property, grabbing money, 
um, embedding and institutionalizing decision-making authority. And in fact, Gelson ends up dealing with this by de facto letting the regents have more power because he can't do much about it. Putin is going to try and do that. Um, banks versus enterprise. Where should money flow? Who should have first dibs on money? Um, Chinovniki versus entrepreneurs versus new Russians. Who should have authority? Who should have resources and on what grounds? So we should expect this is going to be kind of an economic civil war of sorts at the beginning and lo and behold it was. Um, institution building is going to be problematic. It's not so easy as economists think. Institutions don't arise as a solution to transaction costs. Institutions arise in part in struggles over power, status, and resources. So what happens is you get your dispositional conflicts additionally, and then the winners try and routinize and defend their victories through new rules. So institution, there's my mouse, there we go. So institution building ends up being in part an outcome of the struggles over distributional conflicts. Finally, as political scientists easily point out, you get a contradiction of post-socialism. A state is trying to remove itself from the economy, therefore losing its capacity to impose reforms, while it's also trying to reform the economy. Okay. Unless you assume that markets emerge on their own, the Sachs approach, um, you had a big problem here. How does the state withdraw from the economy and shape the economy at the same time? Um, and one of these areas is we see this, in fact, with barter. Woodruff, Gaddy, and Ikes and others um, wrote a lot about this in the late 90s. Liberalization gives your various actors more autonomy to engage in exchange, but at the same time, that decline in state capacity hurts the state's ability to enforce tax collection, monetization, rural stabilization. Um, and the one phenomenon through which you see this all emerge is the explosion of barter. Barter is, at the one, on the one hand, um, a measure of state incapacity to enforce its will, tax collection, monetization. It's resistance not only to paying taxes, though, it's a resistance to bankruptcy. It's a resistance to market discipline. So if the firms out in the regions could not pay suppliers because they're inefficient, they don't have markets, they simply play, pay through barter to Gazprom, to um, steel suppliers, um, gas, et cetera, whoever they could. So barter is resistance not only to the state, it becomes resistance to markets, okay? So if you liberalize, you give these actors autonomy to act, but in turn, they act back upon and against the various reforms that Igar and Sachs and others are trying to impose. <clears throat> so political scientists point out you've got all of these conflicts that are going to emerge once the lid gets blown off of institutions, which is what happens politically. Okay, political economy, politics matters, who would have thought. Um, what's good about this is political scientists first um, raise the issues of conflict. That you're not only gonna have contentious politics, you're going to have contentious economics. Um, something that is off economists' radar entirely. Um, this assumption that markets will lead to efficient outcomes is not true. What it will lead to is new forms of power. And political scientists also did a better job at making sense of variation. Not only in economic outcomes, but also um, variation in terms of policies that were adopted. That Poland takes it a little bit slower than Hungary does, but Hungary is at a, has a better record at implementing reforms than Poland or Russia. Why is it? It has to do with state structures and political parties. Those make the adoption of policy easier and the implementation of policy easier. Um, this also raises for political scientists this constant bugaboo of democracy versus reform. Um, are democracies better at dealing with things like corruption and reform or are dictatorships? Right now, the story seems to be democracies are actually better at it. Surprise, surprise. However, questions still remain that political scientists often tend to avoid. For example, conflict over resources and power. Yes, we know conflict emerges. But how is conflict structured? Okay. In fact, where do the strategies and practices involved in policies, political economy, conflicts, etc., where do those come from? A lot of political science, a lot of political science doesn't open up what institutions are, or some of it tends to assume rational choice. And so this whole question of strategies and structures and practices 
ends up defaulting to new institutional economics, that we're all homo economicus, and that our practices simply reflect our interests. Um, but the reality might be a little more complicated than that. And it's at this point, sociology and anthropology enter um, the game. And they come in later. And here's the interesting thing is you've kind of got this progression. The economists can jump in immediately because they've got a model they think fits everywhere. One size fits, one size fits all. Let's misread Adam Smith, assume humans are the same everywhere, so our models work everywhere. They can jump in without having to have any idea what life is like on the ground. Political scientists have to wait. They have to collect data on evolving institutions. They've got to get a sense of the crystallization of interests and interest groups. So political scientists have to wait before they can. Sociologists and anthropologists actually have to get on the ground and do interviews, do participant observation. It takes time to collect that kind of data. So they're going to come in even later. Um, however, you do have two people who can come in pretty quickly. Carolyn Humphrey is out um, in the field pretty much from day one. So she can come in in the mid 90s with some interesting insights. Catherine Burdery, who had worked on Romania in the socialist era, um, actually can you know, show how smart she is with some interesting proposals about what will happen with those social events. So these are two kind of exceptions to the rule, but they're pretty powerful. Humphrey, I recommend reading them, anyone who's interested in this. Humphrey notes that property is far more than legal status. In fact, what property is ends up being caught up in this kind of general set of practices and meanings regarding value, production, exchange, power, status, and not just in the boardrooms or in the birja, but in everyday life. Property means something on the shop floor, and it means more than simply, I have the right to give orders to you. There's something about the nature of practices that emerges with privatization. Verdery has got this really wonderful um, dichotomy, this binary. Of her, post socialism is going to run into some enormous problems because there's this kind of shift in focus or shift in vision. Um, using the metaphor of kind of vision or looking, um, there's one way of looking under socialism, one way of looking under capitalism, or logics of perception, vision, whatever you want to call it. Under socialism, the focus of practice, economic practice is focused on the supplier. In the deficit economy, in the command economy, um, the hardest part was actually finding people to supply you with the raw materials for production. Once you produced your good, the state took it and distributed it, okay? Whereas the focus under capitalism is on the consumer. Consumer's king, so you've got to find some way of winning over consumers to buy your goods. So instead of looking up the supply chain, you have to focus on looking down the supply chain. And managers who've been in the command economy for a while had a difficult time reorienting around this. Um, related to this are skills involved. Acquisitionmanship. How do you get hold of the supplies, the labor that you need to produce so that you can show that you fulfilled the five-year plan versus salesmanship? How can I actually sell what it is that I have produced? And all of this requires relearning what a business really is. Um, one fascinating place you see this is in marketing. Um, in the middle 1990s, you see this explosion in existing firms and sometimes in new entrepreneurial firms of marketing, marketing divisions, marketing and sales divisions, heads of a marketing division, and they'll take an office in Svetlana or uh, Kirovsky Zavod or Sverdlov, um, all of the, some of which no longer exist, but or like, uh, what was the other, not Electrostila, um, Positron, firms, many of which don't exist anymore. Um, take an office, make it really nice, snazzy, um, and this is our marketing division. What is marketing in the mid-90s for a lot of these former red directors? It's how to sell what you've already produced. Now, this might sound rather simplistic. When you get into what marketing is, the whole point of marketing is it's supposed to be the eyes and the ears of the firm out into the marketplace. What are the available niches? Who are the purchasers out there? What are their tastes? What are they able and willing to spend? And on what? And then you work backwards. Once you know what the market is, you then look at what your productive capacities are and your labor capacities, and then you respond accordingly so that you optimize your income, which sometimes meant for some of these guys, look, you know, Positron, for example, um, you produce electronic equipment, some for the military, some for people, like these huge, enormous VCRs that are about the size of a room, 
I don't know how Nikita or anyone else ever had positron or saw positron VCRs, but they were giant. Um, and they were probably pretty good at launching satellites, but nothing more. Um, they also had a small store uh, right up Liteni Prospect. I forget where it is now. Shukov, or maybe further up. If you walked into Positron's store, there were two rooms. One room had Positron's goods and some Daewoo stuff they were selling. No one ever visited there. And the other room was cigarettes, booze, chocolate, veggies. That's what people were buying. So I asked the director of marketing, no one seems to be buying your stuff. Why don't you just sell orange juice? You can import Del Monte fruit juice, okay? Import it, sell it, you'll make more money. Maybe you build up enough profit, you can reinvest your technology. So in a sense, shift your focus. I mean, US Steel did it. They bought Marathon Oil, started selling oil. Why can't you guys do something? That's what the market means, not your VCRs. And the guy, and his assistant just looked at me blankly. The, the, the conception went over their head. For them, marketing was, we are producing so many goods, five-year plan logic, and now we gotta figure out who to give them to. In a sense, they're getting it backwards. But this makes sense, because they were still locked into this logic of acquisitionmanship. In other words, becoming a market actor meant rethinking what a market is. What's the new market around us? Um, going on to sociologists. Well, you guys know Vadim Volkov, he's written on this. A weakened state creates a niche for violent entrepreneurs, who employ violent capital. The banditi are rational, but they also, in this weird Durkheimian sense, follow rules. Now, Gual I don't need to go any more about what he does. If you don't, go and read his stuff. Um, Michael Kennedy, great guy who is at Brown University, wonderful book on what post socialism was. And it wasn't just new institutions and politics, it was a shift in the totems and meanings of normality grounded in global neoliberalism. In a sense, Kennedy identified this binary and that post-socialism wasn't a natural move from one to the other. Rather, it was an enforced reconstruction of legitimacy from one set of binaries to another. And so socialism and market democracy kind of the opposite poles. And in post-socialism, socialism is linked with things like villain, slave, collective, regressive. Whereas market democracy is framed at the other end of the binary, it's progressive, heroes, freedom, individual. So at post-socialist economic changes, is it isn't simply privatize and liberalize, it's also a remaking of discourse and the remaking of norms and really a remaking of worth, worth of entities such as firms, practices, and even employees and their skills, okay? It's the creation, as it were, of a new kind of hegemony. How am I doing on time? About 10, 15 more minutes, I'll shut up. Um, David Stark and Laszlo Bruch, um, who compared, they're experts on Hungary, but they did a good comparison in the late 90s of East Europe. They posited that post-socialism was actually fields of learning and new practices. Now, this is what they're taking from Pierre Bourdieu this idea of the field. Um, so far, our analysis has been institutional. Look at institutions, laws, organizations. Those shape people's opportunities and incentives. Therefore, you get behavior. According to Bourdieu, however, fields can get struct or institutions are structured into fields. Fields are communities of actors, managers, organizations that have this assumed affinity so that they're together in one community of institutions. And what happens is in this community, actors refer to each other and they look for a common set of norms that govern the use of institutions. Private property by itself can have different meanings and uses. What fields do is they create a community in which there's one assumed normal meaning to property, authority, marketing, et cetera. And what privatization is, is not simply new ownership. Here's my email. Not only new ownership, but also the remaking of fields. Who is allowed inside the new community of ownership and economic decision-making? Who's allowed in? What are the parameters of decision-making? Who has what status? <clears throat> 
This is actually quite important in Russia. The biggest, one of the biggest battles in the 1990s is who has authority within an enterprise. Is it the owner who has bought shares and therefore has property and who's thinking of profit and efficiency? Is it the manager who understands production, who understands what the firm is doing on the ground, who is caring for and understands the labor force? And in the battles over private property, you see both come to the fore with your managers and kind of the communists behind them saying, look, you are allowed to own shares in a business, but that doesn't mean you have ultimate decision-making rights because all you're concerned about is making money. You're not concerned about the social and economic fabric of that collective, okay? This will really, this will really flare up um, after 1995. There's the Zalogovay Privatizatsi, the loans for shares, where the oligarchs are born and Batanin gets Narelsk nickel, um, and Hadorkovsky gets a lot of oil and someone else gets a lot of candy. No sooner have these people received state shares, controlling packet of shares in various profitable enterprises. Then managers push back and say, okay, um, you own shares. That means you are allowed a percent of profit and you can advise. When it comes to everyday decision-making, I'm the manager, I know what's going on. I'm the one who has ultimate rights. And you kind of see this battle, as it were, between knowledge and money, human capital versus economic capital. Those of you who are interested, this is a kind of divide that Pierre Bourdieu sometimes sees in class struggles in the capitalist West. For example, experts versus owners, okay? Managers versus owners, professors versus brokers. Brokers have money, professors have knowledge who has ultimate authority to say what are good policies. And if you're, you know, if you're Republicans, you listen to the brokers. If you're Democrats, you sometimes listen to, listen to the experts. If you're Trump, you listen to the makers of Lysol, et cetera, et cetera. So Clark and Bruce are pointing out that in fact, the rise and creation and conflict around institutions aren't simply about interests. They're also about learning and the competition over what new normal is, okay? So really, interest and strategies end up being linked to the rise of fields and their new rules and the new relations behind them. This is where yours truly comes in. Um, I've got a book I can I scan copies of it for anyone who's interested. I'll go really quickly over this. Or of course, you can go on Amazon and buy it. It's a really great stocking stuff. I highly recommend it like for COVID reading. Um, start with the existing insights, institutional confusion, conflict, which political science has pointed out. There is rational strategic political action as economists and political scientists point out. The power is clearly important. The question is, how does all of this matter? Rational actor theory really isn't working. In particular, the one thing that almost no one pays attention to is how do biographies and experiences matter, okay? This relates to what Bourdieu called habitus, okay? Um, I was really surprised. I really was surprised that Bourdieu did not get used much in post-socialism and really still hasn't been applied. I don't get it. <clears throat> Anyhow, here are Bourdieu's, you know, here's the three legs to Bourdieu's theory. First, capital, various kinds of resources. Money, that's economic capital, we know that. There's social capital, networks, okay, those do matter in clan politics in Moscow, for example. But what about cultural capital? What about symbolic capital? I mean, Human capital, this is all that's going on in that story I just told about battles over privatization. Part of the war is what kind of capital matters? Is it just money, networks, something else? So we can take Bourdieu, go to political science and expand upon the roots of conflict. There are fields, okay, I've talked about fields a little bit, so did Stark and Bruce. But in fact, how institutions come to matter depends upon how these communities of actors make them matter, how they define them. But this is the one that seemed to get missed. Habitus. In Bourdieu's theory, habitus is your structured knowledge and disposition, what you know, how you know it, and what you're inclined to do. A lot of political science and all economics assumes rational choice, which is I have enough information, I have preferences, and I will just do what's most cost efficient to achieve those aims. Bourdieu suggests, however, that wait a minute, our tastes, our preferences, our knowledge are not so free floating. 
And in fact, we're more likely to do that which we have been somewhat programmed to do. In other words, we're not perfectly programmed automatons, okay? But we're not perfectly free individuals like microeconomics has us believe. Rather, we're constrained. We're constrained by the knowledge that we have, okay? Um, so I was like, one area where that came up, by the way, was that story of marketing that I gave you. The story of marketing, amongst other things, shows really well just how important Habitus is. You don't learn the market because Boris Yeltsin um, adopts a set of policies about liberalization, privatization, and tells the central bank, tighten up on money. Rather, learning how to be a market actor really means learning, changing these deeper structures of knowledge. My argument a long time ago, and I, the US kind of did this for a little bit, USAID, is send a bunch of people abroad. USAID in the early 90s had this program where entrepreneurs were chosen and were sent to their sister cities in the US, paired up with American entrepreneurs for a month. That should have been done. Send people to Britain, send people to Finland, and let them just do these um, kind of not, not learning courses, but sit around shadow entrepreneurs for two, three months. Learn the state of the field, then bring that knowledge back, and then support these people with investment, politics, et cetera. That would have been a way of getting at habitus. Um, and there's some stories about USAID I can tell later on. Um, the battles over privatization. Um, what I talked about with this logo by privatization, that was in part habits, capital, um, and status within fields. So how are institutions, enterprises understood? Is the enterprise um, an entity that produces and defends its workforce, or is the enterprise simply a way of making money? So sell Del Monte fruit juice today, sell my land tomorrow, as long as I'm making money, who cares? The enterprise is a bundle of assets, no big deal. Or is the enterprise a productive community that produces certain things, a moral economy, as it were? And it turns out the biographies are actually quite important in all of this. Um, <clears throat> really quickly, one area where you see this has been the political economy of the 90s that helps lead to Putin. Um, you get three elite groups that come out of different structural institutional positions in the Soviet era. That shapes their hobbit boost, that shapes their identities, and their sense of what a normal economy is. You got the red director. The red director. For them, the enterprise is about a labor collective. It's about producing a certain set of goods. It's about knowledge. It's about productive knowledge. You got the rising financial elites, who will, some of whom will become oligarchs. These tended to be people who were in their 20s. They were in the Komsomol. They might have worked in research institutes. They were good, especially if they were in the Komsomol, at moving money around, moving resources around. And some of these people actually get into early import-export, some of it in the shadows, in the late 80s, early 90s. Finally, you've got folks inside the state, especially security officials, some of whom will be the Soloviki of the 2000s. For them, everything is through the prism of the state. The enterprise is a function or an arm of the overall state, or it is an appendage of the state's mission of defending the nation. Okay? So three actors, three visions of a normal economy, and three experiences. Production, especially for the Komsomol, moving money around and being entrepreneurial, or being concerned about state security and status. Um, these folks, the elites from these folks, will start to organize in two groups. The first are these famous political clans that start organizing around Moscow in the mid-90s. You have the Chubayas clan, um, that's the finance clan. You've got the military industrial clan around Alexander Kozhakov and Alex, Alex Skovitz. The natural resources clan around Viktor Chernomir and Nashpom Gazprom. Um, the state-centered clan is kind of in the shadows. They will wait for Putin before they really emerge. And a Moscow clan around Yulushkov, an agrarian clan, they're kind of second fiddle. Furthermore, some of these clans will start to embed their ideas of normality in what are called financial industrial groups. And that's what traditionally group like. Some of these um, will take what's called a defensive form. These would be red direct for whom production is everything, the producers who are engaged or related in production links, so they supply each other, will come together and form their own financial industrial groups. You had one of these in St. Petersburg um, in the mid-90s. The whole idea is firms that produce for each other will solidify those links, 
So it's to try to actually keep themselves alive. Go create a pocket bank that gets money from the state, not cheeky or whoever, and dole that out to support these firms. The rising financial elites will create their own kind of financial industrial group. It will be an empire, but it will be diversified. The idea being you want to reduce the risk of your investment. So you will have um, Hadarkovsky, for example, um, Bank Manatep, Income Bank, um, Anexum Bank. They will start buying um, shares in a diverse number of firms so that if, say, steel production suddenly goes off a cliff, your candy production will keep the whole empire afloat. Your defensive or industrial financial industrial groups, the Red Directors, want to defend production. Your financial elite want to defend income and investment. So again, you've got two visions, not only of what firms are, either production or finances and assets, but also a view of what the economy should be about. Is the economy about production and employment? Is the economy about profit? And these two will battle it out after those loans for shares crises or loans for shares and privatization. What will happen is, um, let me skip over this. By the way, I can share the slides if anyone wants. These are, you know, this is kind of what the differences, the orientations of these different groups, elites and backgrounds are like. Now, long, long, long story short, the first battle is between the red directors and the oligarchs over what should the economy and the firm look like. The oligarchs will win because ultimately they have Yeltsin on their side. Then comes 1998. With the ruble crash in 98, the oligarchs are left exposed. They are weakened. It's 1998, which will lead Yeltsin to hunt around for a good successor who will defend his interests, and that is Vladimir Putin. When Putin comes to power in 2000, this third group gets reactivated. And so the next battle will be between the oligarchs and the Soloviki, between this financial conception of normal economy and this state or dirigiste, French conception of a normal economy. Putin will use Kompromat to chase the likes of Hodorkovsky into jail, Berezovsky to London into his grave, and to get the likes of Putanin to follow the new playbook. And Putin will win, and Russia will look like France. Um, this is the stage we are in right now. It's dirigiste political economy, where you can have private entrepreneurship, but ultimately everything somehow is to serve state and the nation okay who would have expected all of this drama actually has a structure tax couldn't see this a lot of political scientists can't put this together but if you take Bourdieu the stories of marketing the battles between the elites the confusion of the 90s suddenly makes sense and we understand where we are today now I have just talked about Russia um, there is um, Comparisons um, between different countries. If you want to look at it, you can look at a chapter from my new book that is forthcoming. I love this cover. I did not use this before the COVID virus, but man, it doesn't seem to show how prescient I am. Anyhow, there's a chapter in this. It's also now available through Rutledge. I highly recommend you buy several copies, give them to your friends and family, um, get them at Christmas time. They're great stock. Um, so, what's the story of all of this? We bring all the social sciences together. First, um, people are not homo economicus. Anybody who had read Adam Smith would have known this, instead of citing him. And especially people, if anyone had read um, more, his theory of moral sentiments. Um, creating a market, well, shock therapy. Blow up the system and the entrepreneurs, the able social Darwinist manner, will win and they will create a new economy with great institutions. No. Markets are learned. Economies are learned. Learning is difficult in stable situations. Imagine what it's like when you're trying to create new institutions as well as learning. Conflict is not only over resources, but it's also and maybe especially over legitimacy and normality. Um, this is where religion comes in historically. The power of religion is that it defines legitimacy and normality. This is why religious wars are litter human history. Okay? It's not simply a battle over our conception of God, but over our conception of what normal civilization, history, and society and the world and the cosmos look like. People are rational, but that rationality is bounded, as Herbert Simon once said. It's bounded by information asymmetries. It's bounded by our capacity to only hold so much knowledge in our heads. But also, it's the way we think. Um, there is some interesting work in cognitive psych 
that shows that, in fact, we tend to store information in mirror neuron. And that information is contextual. So we're not these perfect computers that microeconomics thinks that we are. We're not an Excel spreadsheet. We're actually quite ritualistic creatures. And so post-socialism is construction and contention over new normalities, not only of economics, as I've talked about, but of gender and politics, which I want to get back to one day, and class. That is, to kind of steal a line from Kotkin, it's about remaking civilization. So that is my story. Thank you very much. And um, whatever questions anyone has, please feel free. We got, as I've got all day, there's no bar for me to go to. Said my linea is closed. And at least I'm not at home where I've been for the last two weeks. So I'm here as long as you guys are. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Haas. <laughs> um, thank you. Thanks for everyone who is still with us. I hope that everybody could hear everything well. No problems. Um, and uh, you can go ahead and I'll give the floor to anyone who has any questions or comments, maybe, or feedback. That was really interesting about the, um, I guess, the breakdown of, uh, I guess, the political alliances between the different um, economic groups, the oligarchs. Um, but uh, what, what, what further readings would you um, recommend to learn more about, I guess, um, the, the relationship between uh, the ruling structure and the uh, economic components? David Hoffman. Um, I've been doing the blockade, I've been forgetting all these titles, but I can remember them off the back of my head. The Oligarchs by David Hoffman. <laughs> I'll start with that one. It's a really great inside work. More journalism than scholarly, but I mean, some journalism can be just as good as the best scholarship. Mm -hmm. It's a really great overview. I, for example, this difference between the concept, the younger, the eventual finance, financial class and the red directors really mm -hmm. comes across. Your older red directors are like, yes, we've seen this before. Khrushchev, Lieberman reforms, didn't go anywhere. This guy will be will come and go. The younger folks who were either their assistants or working in um, computer labs, such as they were, on the Komsomol were like, well, maybe. But hey, it's a chance to make some dough. Let's do it and gain the experience which actually came quite in handy when you get the 90. Um, he also really drives home this point that the real thrust behind shock therapy wasn't that Gaidar and Shubayas believed that Jeffrey Sachs had the keys. Um, they saw a very short window. And what they wanted to do, they weren't thinking of building markets, they were thinking of dismantling the demand economy. And so the whole point of liberalization, privatization, was smash the command economy so that when the communists come back to power, they won't have their hands on the levers of economic power. And that's all pretty clear. I mean, that's, there's a lot of that story. He gets, you know, he gets into some of the personal practices and sides. You can get biography, meets practice, meets conflict. So Hoff, I would start with Hoffman. Mm -hmm. And then, um, Oh God, there's a few others that are in Russian. I have to, I can't, I don't remember who they are. Oh, I want to say Pepe. Pepe, Mia Kaznak, eh? Uh, it was an odd, not entirely Russian surname. It was really good. I'll have to look it up. I mean, any of the, if, you, if any of you kind of find my book illegally downloaded or legally downloaded on the internet, just look in the, the bibliography. A lot of that stuff's there. Um, David Woodruff work. David Woodruff's work is always good in this manner. Um, but for the elite battles, yeah, start with Hoffman, and I'll see if I can find who these other people are. They're there. I just don't remember the name. Oh, um, Stephen White and Olga uh, uh, Kristinovskaya wrote on the Soloviki. So they give an interesting insight into that third group who, you know, in addition to the red directors and the oligarchs came into the game. Mm -hmm. Some of the other stuff that was coming out in the 2000s is also pretty useful um, as well. Excellent. Thank you. 
Yeah, Nick Dendridge, do you have any uh, comments? And our and uh, and Ivan Kurila, are you are you still with us? Yeah. Yes, of course. I, I do have many questions, but maybe I would like to ask the question: When you began your study or your research on uh, transformation in Russia, of course, you were not uh, as wise as you are today, right? And of course, I'm sure that. Uh, uh, there's no big literature on transformation. What was your uh, major hypothesis when you uh, got started? Uh, it's its first question and how basically, you know, what did you do in order to uh, be where you are today? It's first question. The second question, post-socialism. So we can, for instance, explain a uh, Polish success story, not applying Bourdieu at all, I I'm sure. So you might, uh, uh, find uh, easier tools uh, in order to grasp what happens in, in Poland. If we uh, look at Russia or other oil or mineral resource rich countries like uh, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, to some extent Uzbekistan, you will see that uh, more sophisticated theories are needed to understand uh, this post-socialism and uh, basically failure to build uh, sound market economy and uh, uh, democratic institutions. So uh, basically, do we have a u universal toolbox of uh, social sciences, sciences in order to make sense of uh, uh, post-socialist transformation? For instance, if in the future we'll uh, study uh, uh, transformation in Cuba or in Venezuela, what kind of theories uh, you would uh, advise to apply in order to grasp what's going to happen there? In order to make a forecast, not just to explain in reverse what happens. Now, now we know that, you know, Siloviki, uh, always important statists, etc., red directors, uh, etc. But, you know, what kind of groups, for instance, you will identify in the case of Venezuela? Okay, so this type of thing. So just I would like to put the Russian case into comparative perspective and to look at various uh, social sciences which can be applied to better understand. And with minimal, people are lazy. So you cannot apply, you know, all those theories, right? So you're just uh, trying to save your time and apply one particular uh, tool in order to reach, you know, uh, expected result. Wait, wait, wait a minute. We don't tell physicists, if you're going to shoot a rocket at the moon, you got to... You got to have simple. You know, general relativity is too complicated, man. We can't use that. Um, we might. I mean, look. You know, atoms are pretty. As far as we know, atom. I don't think atoms think, do they? Atoms and molecules just kind of do. And mm -hmm. man, is that science really? I did chemistry. This stuff's really complicated. People are even worse. So any theory we come up with is going to be worse than general relativity. That means the smartest of us are the only, all the only ones are going to figure it out and everyone else have to rely on us. So we have to stick with the complexity. That's how we survive. Um, I initially, be, how did I begin this? It was a long time ago. Um, I kind of was Weberian. I mean, my old feeling, having spent six months in 1993 in St. Petersburg and just being amused is the story I tell. Is I remember wanting to buy pizza from one of these street vendors some of you like were probably not born before this happened, but you'd walk out of the subway and there'd be somebody with, you know, like a little pita bread and they'd put like ketchup on it and something else and it'd be like a street pizza, right? And they would put pieces of hot dog on it. Something I've never understood. I hate hot dogs. And a pizza with hot dog is an abomination. Okay? That would bring down God's wrath. So I told this guy who was making them. They weren't pre-made. He was making them. Remorse guy. I came out and said, can I get one without a hot dog on it? I'm thinking, this should be pretty simple. A, it's less stuff, less movement he has to do, and he saves money on the hot dog. Why not do that for me? His response is, nope, we don't do them that way. Like, shitting me. I'm making your life easier. I'm like, nope, we don't do it that way. And this happened several times in different manners in 1993. I'm like, you're not being, it's like, where's my Paul Samuelson? This is not supposed to be happening. And so I went back tried to figure out how I was going to approach this, and tried to do Max Weber. But where's the Protestant ethic? Well, not Protestantism. But is there a capitalist ethic lurking behind all of this? 
<clears throat> so that's why I did the, you know, I did participant observation, I did lots of interviews. And um, in the process of doing all that, I realized I had no clue what I was doing. None of the stuff I was looking at was working. So I just kept collecting data, collecting data, collecting data, left, came back home, reread my Bourdieu, didn't quite get it, wrote the dissertation, revised the book, and as I was revising it, all of a sudden the light came on that all of this stuff. I was really talking about you know, the whole marketing, privatization, how do I bring all these things together? And it was really about creating and learning normality and the conflict over normality. And so kind of Bourdieu, rereading him later on, brought everything together. So I went out in the field with something really different from what I'm doing now. How you take that further? Now, this is where things get really interesting. It's not entirely the case that Bourdieu replaces um, a lot of the political economy that we know. Um, it's that what Bourdieu can do is kind of provide the guts. Here's, Here's one way of thinking about it. Um, I'm going to go back to my chemistry to do this. Because on the one hand, if you look at like anything involving chemical production, right? You're dealing with molecules. So you got the structure of molecules. You got the atoms in the molecules. You got the, the bonds between the molecules. There's a lot of different stuff going on there. So you have to understand structural dynamics. That would be the political science. You have to understand the quantum mechanics. That would be cognitive psychology. And you got to understand what goes on in the bonds between the atoms. That's, you know, that's sociology. Bourdieu promises a way of bringing that all together so that I can take the predictive power of political science and ground it in the cognitive psych and a theory of practice. Um, you know, it's this kind of thing where you do something that you know works and you don't know why. I think a lot of political science and political economy is still in that phase. That there is, there are explanations, you know, state-centered explanations, for example, that work, because you're looking at institutions and institutional configurations at a macro level. That's like you know, molecular structure. But what goes on under here that makes this work? And what's the relation between the two? That's where we still have a lot of work to do. So you want to create an economy that works and works well. We have to take into account the, the usual political economy that looks at um, resource dependency, Dutch disease, okay? Um, if you focus on too many resources, then yes, you cannot maneuver. That makes perfect sense. That's only one part of the story. And how does that structure translate down into practices? Because those practices could really matter too. For example, Japan, Germany, and the US all have corporations, factories that look the same. We all have stock markets, right? We all produce goods. We don't depend on oil. But the Germans and Japanese can tend to do a better job of producing quality goods than we can. That's because there are different practices of production. Workers have much higher status vis-a-vis -vis owners and engineers than in the US. That's the stuff going on below. So Germany, Japan, the US, similar institutions, similar structures, but it's the guts, the quantum mechanics where things differ. And so you want to create a great economy, you've got to get into the, you have to look at the big structures, dependency on oil or not. And then the stuff that's going on below. Now, there is no grand unifying theory about that yet. I don't know if there will ever, ever be because the social sciences are constructed in the most inane ways. Instead of the, the natural sciences do it right. Start with the atom, the molecule, the cell, the body, so that you can have the synergy between them. The social sciences beat each other up because we're kind of dealing in the same level. And so our insights can never be, you know, can never cross fertilize. You know, it's really awful how we end up doing this. I don't know how we'll get out of that. Um, but any kind of grand theory that comes along is gonna to have to take into account things like norms and practices and structures, human rationality and all of that. Um, it's going to be multi-dimensional. Um, so you'll have individual cognition and practice, microeconomics, cognitive psychology, but structures and institutions will have their own um, emergent properties. That's Marx, by the way. Marx is emergent property. And we've kind of forgotten that. We need to get back into, are there particular um, configurations of structures and institutions that work better than others? And there's a meso level that is where Bourdieu seems to be filling in the blanks. Will any of this ever be able to predict? This is an entirely different conversation, but what I will say is the older I get, I don't think, I think that's the mistake. 
social science is still stuck in that model that we learned from high school physics. Of if I've got the angle of the cannon like this, and I've got so much gunpowder, the ball will go here. Okay, and if I raise the angle and put more gunpowder in, it'll go further. We're used to that kind of thinking. And I think the better way of approaching this is fluid flow, where I think I can, I really can't get from point A to point B. I can get from point A to point A1 to point A2 to point A3, okay? That is exactly how general relativity works. You really big time physics uses tensor mathematics and does these incredible, this is why Einstein could barely do it. It requires these complex you know, 11 dimensional computations because what you're doing is you're saying where an object is at any infinitesimal point in time. And I think that's the direction we have to go in the social sciences because that's what practice is. If that makes any sense. So that's um, a long answer to a really important question. And I don't have any more answers beyond that um, because no one's paying me enough money to spend all of my time. I have to do things like teach and eat and that kind of stuff. <laughs> I just have like sources of money so I can spend all my time thinking about it. Please, I, I'm more than willing to fail um, at the process. Thanks. Any other two friends uh, questions that you have, uh, Professor Ivan Kurila? Are you are you, are you with us? Can you hear us? Yep. He's ah. there. Uh, you're muted. The great dilemma. Always forget to turn off their their mute, or it doesn't work. One or the other. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Something happened, probably. <laughs> yeah. Is he with us? Is the one with yeah. us? I'm trying to understand because he started to speak and then. Uh, There's the chat function. Which I yeah, never, yeah, that's what I'm doing. Uh huh. Thank you. I have no, 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 no comments with you. There. Thank you for. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well. Uh, thank you uh, a lot, Jeff. Thanks again for uh, joining us. This was, by the way, our first uh, uh, online guest speaker event uh, for, for, for this semester and actually I think for the history of the programs because we usually had our guests uh, here in St. Petersburg and uh, at the European University building. Well, luckily we did have the chance to host you in uh, November 2019 and I very much hope that uh, uh, in the coming fall you can you can make it to Petersburg. Any plans of coming to Petersburg, by the way, when, when this is gone? I'll figure out when this is done first. I hope you get over there sooner rather than later. I've got to sit down and have a chat with the folks at Betteba, so. Um, hopefully sooner rather than later. <laughs> All right. Well, th thanks again, once again, for this uh, wonderful lecture on, uh, on the transformations, which I hope will will uh, provoke more thoughts for uh, among all of us here. And uh, we'll see what the what the COVID, what kind of changes it brings to. Because before the beginning of the lecture, you were talking about the end of civilizations, as I remember the the wording. Let's see if this is going to, <laughs> to lead to that. Sorry. Another great transformation. How lovely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Ex exactly. Okay. Thank you, everybody.